Uh, welcome everybody to the August 8th Metasploit Sprint demo meeting. Um, we canceled the, we didn't do the one last uh, two weeks ago because of uh, technical issues out in Vegas. So we've got uh, lots of extra content this week. Um, so let's get started. We'll take a look at, oh yeah, we're out in Vegas. Sorry about that. We still got, we still got the Vegas graphics. Yeah, out at Hacker Summer Camp. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I think they're appropriate. Good times. Um, so, and now we'll get started. Okay. So the open pull requests. Um, you can see they've been ticking up there lately. Um, super high, super high. It's, 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 I don't know if it's quite reached where it was or maybe, yeah, it kind of looks like it might have. In any case, uh, that's um, a good problem to have, I reckon. Uh, I'm just going to get on that, that PRQ. So thanks to everybody who's been um, contributing. And speaking of contributors, uh, let's see. Uh, here's the top contributors for this past, past month for anybody uh, playing along at home. Uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate that. So what's going down? Uh, a number of things. Uh, the Google Summer Code continues on, but it's going to be wrapping up this month. Is that right, Brent? Yeah, at the end of the month, we should have all the final projects wrapped up and um, you know, in, in a pretty good shape. I think uh, Metasploit Bowl 3 are uh, getting close yeah. to, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but that's looking really awesome. Um, we've been doing a lot of really good work on Linux Stager support and uh, the uh, initial FTP file session stuff is up as a PR as well. So sure. making good progress. So it looks like we're going to have a down to the wire finish, but it's going to be exciting. <laughs> well, there you go. Keeping it interesting. It's great, great stuff there. Uh, lots of convention stuff going on. Um, we just got back from those. Uh, and uh, something for folks to note, um, Egypt has uh, moved on from Rapid7. Uh, let's go. Definitely expect to still see him um, poking around in Metasploit and, and being, you know, being a community member. Um, it's a little bittersweet there, but yeah. he'd been here forever, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, good, good on him. Um, yeah, so I actually went ahead and re-added him as a as a public contributor. I know I didn't really follow the uh, the proper guidelines for adding public contributors back to the uh, Metasploit, but um, I figured it was uh, a special case since he's like one of the people who has to approve it. So uh, kind of one of those uh, <laughs> circular logic sort of things. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, fair enough. All right, cool. Um, all right, we've got uh, like I said, since we didn't have the uh, demo meeting last time, we've got some a lot of content here. Uh, things that landed, we've got quite a few uh, RCE exploits. Um, some of the more interesting ones, the Razor Synapse software. For yeah, that's, that's a pretty cool one. So if you don't know about this, uh, so Razor it makes keyboards and mice and all kinds of really cool gamer stuff that lights up in lots of different multicolored LEDs. Um, uh, what basically yeah. happened here is that Razor has this software that's meant for like changing the colors of your keyboard. And um, and uh, they had a local privilege escalation in the driver that they installed to, to control your keyboard. Uh, the neat thing is that uh, at least for about three or four weeks, this was an O-Day that automatically gets installed by Windows whenever you install, plug the keyboard into your computer. Um, so pretty pretty fancy stuff there. Um, it is a local privilege escalation. You, of course, have to get onto the box to get to, to raise, to you know, basically doing your injection. But uh, thanks to Zero Stein for finding that one as a pretty fun bug. And in fact, um, Razor's put out some new software releases, and I haven't verified this yet, but they have no mention of any security updates um, in any of them. So it may oh, still wow. be um, an open issue right now. Wow. Keep, keep your eyes open on that one. Um, IP fire. That we had one that was related to the uh, Oink code. Like mm -hmm. this is snort related. Yeah. To, you know. Yeah. So some some snort remote code execution as well, and some of the uh, the Cisco IP fire appliances. So pretty neat stuff there. Um, Microsoft Windows uh, link vulnerability. Yeah, they, yeah. they seem to come up about once every six months or so. Um, but this one's pretty interesting in that. Um, it basically uh, attacks something in like, like I think an animated icon and, um, and and basically allows it to run arbitrary DLLs that way. You do have to guess what drive your USB drive might show up as. It's, it's kind of ironically that this vulnerability only works from a USB drive. Um, it doesn't seem to work from a UNC share or something like that, but it's a perfect kind of social engineering sort of thing. You plug it in. Um, you can even plug it in from a VM point of view, and um, it'll automatically execute the code and uh, start running a DLL of your choice. And the neat thing is that um, and the thing that's kind of special about this is um, uh, it actually bypasses all of Microsoft's uh, signature checking because the way it loads the DLL, it sort of implicitly trusts um, the code that it runs. Nice. So uh, it bypasses your AV and stuff like that all by itself. So neat. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, then a number of others there. Um, we also had some uh, scanner modules uh, and an unauthenticated password reset in Mantis BT. Um, also landed some some new stuff uh, with Windows Interpreter, right? We got the is it high DPI uh, screen capture? Now it will capture the full screen, right? Yeah, that's right. I think we demoed that a couple 
a couple of print so. demos ago, but yeah, we finally got it actually PR'd, sort of set, set in my queue for a while. It's there. Uh, but thank, thanks to Bill Webb for, for doing that initial work. And I think he's got some future work that may be really interesting too that can capture video from your desktop. So nice. We'll, just, we'll take a look for that later. Cool. Yeah, right on. And there's a quieter threads feature now, yeah? Yeah, so basically it used to be that when Interpreter would crash itself, it would pop up a big window saying Interpreter's crashed. Um, it doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> so that's a, that's a nice feature. You might have. as well just turn on the busy light wire. Oh, sorry, that's for oh, the yeah. talk about yeah. that anyway. But yeah. So now, now if there's a failure, they'll, it'll quietly kind of, Interpreter threads will just kind of quietly go away. Yeah, yeah. march off into the sunset. All right, good. And we have uh, OSX Railgun support with the Python interpreter. Yeah, for sure. Um, right now, it 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 can only talk to C APIs. Um, one of the limitations is a lot of the cool stuff in OSX is actually in Objective C, but um, at some point in the future, we may look at extending it to be able to talk to those APIs as well. Yeah, right on. Um, related to the uh, OSX uh, Mac OS theme, there um, the native code interpreter is available, and we've added streaming audio capture support to that one. Yeah, yeah, and it and sort of trailing off the Objective C thing. One of the nice things about having the Objective Code one is because is you can actually talk to the Objective C um, parts of the operating system directly from the native code version. Some people oh, were asking, right, yeah. well, what are the benefits of that over Python? While Python does have some support for um, Objective C in OS X, we found that it crashes quite a bit, hmm. um, sort of by you know, accidental experience. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be able to get things leveled up on both sides. But for right now, you, yeah, the, the, the auto streaming is pretty cool if you haven't tried it out. Um, oh, yeah. Right on. Cool. And if we're related to the hardware bridge, we uh, had a, a community contributor help us out with some low ball support, which allows you to like lower the threshold for your receivers, uh, which can pick up noise, but can also be useful in getting maybe a more accurate read of, of what you're receiving. Yeah. And, and he actually, the, the contributor said something like he's got a really cool module to come up that, that adds something on top of this support. I'm kind of looking forward to see what that's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I really like that. Keep the suspense building there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, he says resource uh, scripting support for standard in. Yeah, is that something that will land in? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, the idea here there is um, you can actually generate dynamic resource scripts and just pipe them into Metasploit and sort of uh, run it at re in real time. This is actually being used by our our new automated payload testing infrastructure, but it can actually be used by other people who want to integrate Metasploit, but not necessarily use the RPC interface. You can actually just stream resource scripts right into Metasploit and control it um, directly. Um, this also might be interesting. There's some other tools that we're looking at uh, evaluating that can run um, external commands as sort of a, a wrapper around the CLI, and we may uh, look at, at how to, to, to integrate with that later. So. Nice. Yeah, right on. And we had uh, ad added support for uh, in the SSH modules here. You want to talk about the ED? Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. So anyway, this funny story behind this one is um, is someone someone sort of submitted a, a sort of a joke pull request mm -hmm. where they just added one space to uh, to a module and said we updated the coding style and wrote like a couple paragraphs on and that. And so I kind of took them up on the word and said, all right, well, if you're going to fix one space, I might as well fix the rest of them. And then about 12 commits later, um, I had accidentally added uh, ed25519 support for SSH mm -hmm. modules. Um, I will apologize in advance, though. That does require libsodium to get built. So the next time you do a bundle update in Metasploit, you're going to have to wait for a little bit of comp compilation. But just hold tight. It's totally worth it. Um, you can you can now connect to all the modern SSH implementations as a result. Nice. And then the busy light we mentioned a minute ago. Uh, we, uh, womp, uh, womp. Uh, there's a Mimikatz module that would automatically turn on a busy light. I had to go look up what a busy light was, to be honest. But, uh, <laughs> it would automatically turn it on when the Mimikatz was active, I guess. Yeah, so, so yeah, a busy light is basically this little USB device you can plug into your computer. And, and if you're busy at your desk, like you don't want anyone to bother you, rather than just have putting on your headphones and pretending you're listening to music, you can have this little light turn red or green or whatever. It turns out, at least for a couple of years, Mimikatz has had the ability to turn this light on. Um, whenever it gets used, and um, and the, the sort of the joke here was that you should really read all the source code to all your tools. That's why being open source, someone could have looked at it, but we didn't look at it exactly as closely as we should have. And but anyway, the busy light was turned on. We turned it off. It was slipped by for a while. No, yeah. Okay. Nice catch by OJ there. Um, let's see, uh, more things in the works. Uh, the uh, interpreter extension support for the for metal, uh, mm -hmm. the POSIX stuff. So hopefully we have something to demo uh, this next meeting after that. Um, we have, uh, so you want to talk about, what any of particular you want to talk about particular, Brent? Or just go down the list? Well, I have to be admit that I'm kind of biased here because it says there's a lot of module stuff or a lot of payload stuff in here, but some pretty sexy stuff that, that's coming up along, along um, soon. Um, like actually just yesterday, um, some, someone was working on uh, a, a new aux module written in Python that used a, a library that we have support for in Ruby. Um, and uh, we actually got a PR for adding, so you can run aux modules as external modules. Um, so that's pretty cool. Nice. Um, uh, one of our Google Summer Code guys has been working on the Linux Stager encryption, 
um, which will be, we'll have to be able to pass Linux to ages so that the mature precision, that kind of stuff as, as encoded as ARC4. Um, we changed the, the scope a little bit. Originally, we were going to do HTTPS, but it was kind of hard to fit that into a Linux stager, but ARC4 looks like it's going to fit pretty well. Um, Metasploitable 3 images, we're, we're testing them in Vagrant Cloud, yeah, because yeah. one of the biggest problems people have is like, I can't bring it up, it's so hard, it takes so long. Um, this will actually save people a lot of bootstrapping time, um, and, and later on, if we could uh, Metasploit class, it'll also help the, the class out a bit. Um, named pipe tunneling is actually coming again from Interpreter. In 2006, we worked on a PR for a while, um, kind of found some, some limitations with regards to how tunneling a Metasploit session over Metasploit session worked. Um, moving forward, um, we're actually getting first-class pivoting support in Metasploit, and that's actually going to take advantage, be taken advantage of inside the named pipe tunneling. Uh, the neat thing about the named pipe tunneling is that it looks just like normal Windows SMB traffic whenever you're um, doing things, you know, peer-to-peer. -peer. So it won't look, nice. it, from like an ops point of view, it, it won't look super suspicious, um, and it's actually using just the normal Windows um, APIs to do it. So look forward to that. Um, actually, I think the PR, if it's not up today, I haven't checked my email this morning, it'll be up tomorrow. So cool. nifty Very stuff cool. there. Um, Let's see, uh, Metasploit Data Models of Service, we may have a demo of that today. I'm not sure if that's on your docket, but uh, basically we're working on the ability to get the data model actually separated from the rest of Metasploit. And uh, so Chris Chris has been working on a lot of uh, uh, rewrites to, to get that, that happening, but it's gonna be pretty cool. It already increases the performance of Metasploit, but it also makes it so that anyone can use the data model of Metasploit outside of Metasploit. Yeah, that's great. Some nifty stuff there. I'm sorry, there's so much stuff in the works. <laughs> well, um, I, mean, <laughs> I think there are, are there's like at least 20 modules in, in the PR queue right now, so we've got a lot of stuff um, it, that people are really excited about. Um, we've got an interesting PR. Um, I'll say it's interesting because I wrote it, but um, <laughs> that actually unifies the MSF Venom and the Generate commands, and also makes it so that MSF Venom runs as an alias for Generate. So when you're inside of Metasploit, if you type MSF Venom, you get an immediate payload. Um, so pretty nifty stuff there. Right. Um, some things we had as a, as a customer request uh, was, was to add SSL scan support, um, which is basically a, a nice SSL um, scanner, <laughs> as you might say. Um, there's some really cool stuff that, that, that was almost dropped during DEF CON, and it should actually be showing up pretty soon in our peer queue, um, that basically extend PSExec PS to use Windows scripting host as, as basically a vector for, for running code and, and loading um, DLLs in the memory. So I look forward to that too. Um, we've also been doing some, some more design work on the Crypt TLB stuff, and uh, Metasploit Aggregator version 2 will be coming down the pipeline. That's it's still in the thinking stages, but, um, but there's some pretty sexy stuff coming down the oh, pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of goodies. All right, we'll get on to our team updates here. So the A-team, uh, payload testing infrastructure VM automation has been released, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we put out that, that repository this year and had, or I'm sorry, this last week and had yeah, a big blog post about right. it. Yeah, and we've cool. got two more um, repos that should be coming out soon that have to do with uh, the baseline builder and the automated payload testing. So basically we'll make it so that anyone who wants to test all the Metasploit payloads on all these OSs can actually do it. Yeah. So How cool is that, right? It's really cool. Yeah. And then you mentioned the Metasploitable, uh, well, well, sorry, you mentioned Metasploitable 3 in the sense of the Vagrant Cloud. But we have a new release uh, coming out. We're in the final stretch of, of working on that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's been chefized and um, and possibly some 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 gamification as well is being added. Possibly. So I, I won't I won't spill the beans on that quite yet. But um, look forward to that coming up pretty soon. Yeah, that's very cool. And we had some Metasploit training out in uh, Black Hat, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wilvu and I actually helped teach uh, about 75 students um, how to use Metasploit from basics to advanced, and that was really successful. Nice. Very cool. What about these de developer quality life improvements I hear so much about, Brent? <laughs> what about those? Yeah. So, I mean, basically, kind of been going with the, the philosophy that if you find uh, a broken window, fix it. And so there's been a lot of things going into Metasploit that have um, not necessarily been things you'd see from a, from a coder point of view, but you'd see as a developer. One of them is um, we've often said, hey, everybody, use RuboCop, but please ignore half the things that it tells you to do because they're, they're, they'll either give you a lot of busy work or maybe they're not what you actually want to do. Um, we've actually been refining those rules quite a bit so that there's like 10 fewer than there were before. But now you can actually write a module in Metasploit style and get it down to zero warnings. Um, so that's pretty nice. And you get all the all the, all the the sort of the niceties of, you know, hey, are things aligned? Am I calling things properly? But without all of the, uh, please please write your code upside down if you prefer it that way. Um, so uh, so yeah, um, we're actually looking forward in the future to even enabling that by default during the checks so that we don't necessarily have to have people who are doing code review say, hey, you don't have things aligned right or whatever. Yeah, oh, that's awesome, good stuff. And the Xanatos team, uh, it's, uh, when when possible, poor Dave has been pulled off on about every other thing, uh, but Ruby SMB, 
presses on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, in, in that vein, also uh, SMB Loris. Yeah. So we've got we'll have a demo of that uh, shortly here. Um, Project Goliath, uh, the database, uh, next generation stuff's been been ongoing. Metal extension support and uh, Framework Fridays, which clearly we're not making a big dent in, but we need to. <laughs> Maybe we need right. Framework Wednesday, Fra Thursday, Thursday, Fridays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Framework, Fra framework, framework Monday through Friday. <laughs> right on. All right, Dave, you want to you want to show yeah. us some SMB Loris if I give you the keys to the kingdom, or at least make you presenter. Give me the microphone so I can take it away. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that too. Uh -huh. One thing at a time here. This past week, uh, Brent came over to me and said, hey, maybe take a break from Ruby SMB stuff to, to take a look at this SMB Loris thing that's, uh, that's going around. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple denial of service attack uh, discovered by, uh, I believe that's actually Zero Sum and uh, Jenna Magius, uh, their, their meat space names, uh, but I wasn't 100% certain of that. Uh, so, anyways, basically, what this uh, what this exploit, uh, in more general terms, does is it uh, takes advantage of a flaw in the NetBIOS session service component of uh, SMB, and that's both Windows SMB and Samba are both vulnerable to this. And so, if you look here, uh, I've actually created a little bin data structure to represent an NBSS header, and you can see that the the message length is the last 17 bits. Of, of this uh, header. And so if we set that to the maximum possible value, when we send that request, it will, the victim will automatically pre-allocate that much memory uh, for what it thinks is the rest of the SMB command coming down the pipe. Uh, this works even if SMB1 and SMB2 are both disabled on the machine. So as long as the service is available, even if the underlying, like, uh, service mechanisms aren't running, this uh, denial of service attack will still work because it'll still allocate the memory. Um, and it's it's really straightforward. All it does is it runs through and opens as many connections as possible. Uh, so we just iterate through uh, currently all the non-privileged source ports, uh, connect, to the, connect to 445 on the victim, uh, send this NBSS header with the max length, uh, and now I actually just today at zero sums request changed it to run continuously until stopped. So what will happen, what used to happen was it would wait 30 seconds at the end, which is the max time for one of these sockets to stay alive. Instead, now what it'll do is once it gets to uh, 65,535, it will roll back to the beginning. If the, um, if the next port it reaches is still alive, then it disconnects it and refreshes it and starts it new. Uh, and so then it just basically runs through that whole thing. Um, it's pretty simple here. Uh, got a standard description and basically just target options. Uh, we also ha have module docs for this because every new module yeah. should have the markdown module documentation. Uh, and you can see that over here. Hooray. Um, so anyways, uh, so over here, we're gonna have our victim which is just a Windows 7 box uh, running in a VM for purposes of the demo. Um, make sure I have the latest changes in here. And we're gonna go, oh no. Womp womp. Uh, unified local method G. <laughs> you no, know, I was thinking in my head. Hey, maybe he shouldn't load the latest changes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while, I, <laughs> yeah. That, that's probably true. Uh, I must have hit a key while I was in there. Let's try that again. Reloading. Ah, there we go. And now we can see it's just cycling through. If it runs into a source port that it can't actually um, uh, connect from, it'll just send an a, a error message out to the screen, which you just saw one flash by. Uh, like port 22 will, in most cases, obviously throw an error because there's something already bound to that if you're running SSH. Uh, but it's just going to cycle through here. And we look, we can see the memory spike right here. And now the machine is still running at this point. But if we start trying to do things that want to allocate more resources, like, for example, 
uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to start a Wireshark capture uh, th throws an error saying that it doesn't have enough memory to allocate the kernel buffer. Or even more simplistically, uh, if I open up Windows Explorer here, uh, it doesn't have sufficient memory left to actually connect the network share attached to this system anymore. And so we can see that it's, no matter how many times we try it, oh, I lied. Uh, Demo gods. Normally, uh, this would uh, reject. So somehow, oh, somehow we got a drop off there again, uh, where yeah. where they are. Uh, it's, it's going back up now. So what probably happened is some of those connections expired before enough of them had been recreated to, to keep the uh, memory allocation up again. Not so now. I bet if we click on this, yeah. See, and now if we click on this again. Um, so it's not 100% perfect. I'm going to see if there's some more work I can do to make it uh, even better. But for now, it it's definitely a working uh, denial of service and kind of proves the point. Um, and any beefier system, one, uh, one machine sending these packets isn't going to be enough to, to bring it down anyways. Uh, the theoretical maximum for one host generating this traffic is about 8 gigs of allocate, allocated memory. Um, hey David, uh, James has said it. Can you show the processes tab? I want to see what prod is taking up all the memory. It's uh, you're uh hold on. I think it's on the kernel. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's going to be it's going to be drivers. Uh, so you're not going to see it here in any of the processing. Uh, it's all going to be in kernel space. Um, thing I did not learn know until uh, Ned Pyle uh, corrected me on something just the other day on Twitter. SMB runs entirely as drivers uh, in Windows, so there is no user space component. To it whatsoever, which I actually did not realize. Image is a 32-bit driver at that, right? It does not actually, because that was my my. I had asked him uh, with SMB1 about to go the way of the dinosaur. Finally, uh, would SMB go fully native 64-bit? Um, and he told me that on native 64-bit systems, SMB is fully 64-bit now. Okay. So. Uh, it, that was not the information that I was operating under, so I learned two things when I asked him. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's all driver space. You can't actually see it uh, running from a process here, uh, but you can see the performance spikes. So that's uh, that's SMB Loris. Nice, awesome. Thank you, Dave. That was a good demo. If I have a question for your for your progress, if rather than saying how many packages you send, it says how much memory it's consumed. <laughs> Can't tell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because it's a set amount of memory for each packet. You would well, wait, but it, but it can't where the system, it can, but it can calculate what it should be consumed at that point. Right, yeah. except when it ticks back over, you it would be very hard to know like right. how many sockets are still open. And that would. If you, if you, were, you received back the reset the, the reset packet because if you did, you could get from it based on. What we stop listening at that point. Yeah. So. Yeah, it does keep track of its. Uh, it would create. Frame. It would, the, the big problem there is we don't want to create so much overhead that we end up <laughs> denial of servicing framework. And so we try and uh, do as little with those sockets as possible. So we basically leave them in like a half open state and then just reap them when we're about to refresh them. Just create and forget, right? Create the sockets and forget about them. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's, it's a complete fire and forget. In fact, my original efforts on this, I, I tried to do something a little clever, which was do it in threads and then uh, then kill the thread uh, with uh, SO linger option set on the socket so that it would simulate basically like a, prog an, uh, a program shutdown or, or something like that that would not send a, a thin or reset packet from our side and have the linger hopefully make the operating system keep the, the socket open for a while before actually reaping it. That way, framework wouldn't hold the resources properly. Uh, but some stuff about how I/O works in Ruby made that an uh, untenable solution, unfortunately. And didn't Microsoft say that they are not going to fix this patch? Uh, yeah. So Microsoft's official response so far has been that they're not rushing to fix this because you'd have to be an idiot to put put it on the internet. 
those are their words, not mine. Um, however, you know, in, in sort of typical fashion, I think they miss uh, miss the mark a little bit here. Although there are SMB services put on the internet, it's still a real danger once somebody establishes a beachhead inside your environment. SMB tends to be wide open on the internal network, and most importantly, it tends to be open on domain controllers. So you could very easily use this to bring down a, a, an environment's domain controller setup just by establishing that initial beachhead and then forwarding all this traffic through to it. So uh, it, is, it is a danger, um, and I think one that they should take seriously. Especially if the complete, or if, if the complete access to a domain controller is just need to force a restart. Got a question, Jim? Oh, yeah, I was, I was going to... Say, uh, is it possible to, after you have sent the four bytes uh, after the socket connection, and then wait a little, little bit of time and send one byte at a time just to keep the socket open for a longer period of time? So the problem with that is that the, the reason this works is that it's, um, pre, it's pre-allocating an expectation of that SMB packet. Right. And from what I've seen, and I haven't tr tracked this down, I haven't run like actual like kernel debuggers to prove it, but it seems like if you send something else that it's not expecting after that, it basically triggers it to reset its state machine uh, yeah. so that it no longer is waiting for that SMB or SMB2 packet to come in. Um, I tried with keep alives, also try doing like a keep alive setup also. Unfortunately, the our socket implementation doesn't seem to have uh, doesn't seem to have a um, way of setting the keep idle uh, inter uh, the interval time. Yeah. That's so you common. can you can set you can set the count you can set the count you can set the interval but you can't set the t uh, the time before the the keep alive start. Um, it's usually an hour by default on Linux, which isn't going to help. Very and two hours on on OS X and BSD. Yeah. So. Uh, that really doesn't help us. Like you, we'd need, we'd have to have it set down to like 10 seconds uh, to start firing keep alives. Um, one well, other sending, sending actual bytes like right, I know, I, regular good yeah, uh, right, and that's why I said what, what I was saying before. Mm -hmm. If you send actual bytes, mm -hmm. then it's going to change the state machine on the victim service, and it will no longer necessarily be in that state where it's got that memory allocated. Oh. So. The, the best way to do it at this point, if it would even be that helpful, uh, would be to do this with raw sockets instead of TCP sockets and uh, sending manually crafted uh, TCP keep alive packets. That seems like a lot of length to go to, though, for this. So, cool. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, Thanks. good stuff. Thanks.